Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today I want to talk to you about a couple of advanced topics, in particular looking into sparse annotations. So we know that data quality and annotations is extremely costly. And in the next couple of videos, we want to talk about some ideas how to save annotations. So the topics will be weekly supervised learning and self-supervised learning. Okay, so let's look at our slides and see what I have for you. So the topic weekly and self-supervised learning. And we start today with looking into limited annotations and some definitions. Later, we will look into self-supervised learning for representation learning. So what's the problem with learning with limited annotations? Well, so far we had the supervised learning and we've seen these impressive results achieved with large amounts of training data consistent, high-quality annotations. So here you see some example. We had annotations for instance-based segmentation, and there we had simply the assumption that all of these annotations are there. We can use them, and they are maybe even publicly available, so it's no big deal. But actually, that's in most cases not actually true. So typically, you have to annotate. An annotation is very costly. So uh, if you look at image level class labels, you will spend approximately 20 seconds per sample. So here you can see, for example, the image with dog. There's also ideas where we try to make it faster, for example, by instance spotting that you can see here in reference 11. If you then go to instance segmentation, then you actually have to draw outlines, and that's at least 80 seconds per annotation that you have to spend here. And if you go ahead to dense pixel level annotations, you can easily spend one and a half hours for annotating an image like this one. So you can see that in reference four. Now the difference between weakly supervised learning and strongly, you can see in this graph. So here you see that if we have image labels, of course we can classify image labels and train that, and that would be essentially supervised learning. Training with bounding boxes to predict bounding boxes, and training with pixel labels to predict pixel labels. Of course, you could also abstract from pixel labels to bounding boxes or from bounding boxes to image labels, and that all would be strong supervision. Now, the idea of weakly supervised is that you start with image labels and go to bounding boxes, or you start with bounding boxes and try to predict pixel labels. So this is the key idea in weekly supervised learning, that you somehow want to use a sparse, a few annotation example, and then create much more powerful predictors. So the key ingredients for weekly supervised learning are that you use priors. You use explicit and implicit priors about shape and size, contrast. Also motion can be used, for example, to shift bounding boxes. The class distributions, some classes are much more frequent than others, and similarity across images. Of course, you can also use hints like image labels, bounding boxes, image captions can be used as weekly supervised labels, sparse temporal labels that are then propagated over time, scribbles, or clicks inside objects. And here are a couple of examples of such sparse annotations for scribbles and clicks. And there are some general approaches. One from labels to localization would be that you use a pre-trained classification network. And then, for example, you can use tricks like in the lecture on visualization that you produce a qualitative segmentation map. So here we had this idea of backpropagating the class label into the image domain in order to produce such labels. Now the problem is that this classifier was never trained for localized decisions. 
And the second problem is good classifiers don't automatically yield good maps. So let's look into another idea. And the key idea here is to use global average pooling. So let's rethink about the fully convolutional networks and what we've been doing there. You remember that we can replace fully connected layers that have only a fixed input size by m time n convolution. And if you do so, you see that if we have some input image and we convolve with a tensor, then essentially we get one output. Now, if we have multiple of those tensors, then we would essentially get multiple channels. And if we now start moving our convolution masks across the image domain, you can see that if we have a larger input image, then also our outputs will grow with respect to the output domain. And we've seen in order to resolve this, we can use global average pooling methods in order to produce the class labels, per instance. Now, what you can do also in alternative is you pool first to the correct size. So let's say this is your input. Then you first pool such that you can apply your classification network and then go to the classes in a fully connected layer. So you essentially switch the order of the fully connected layer and the global average pooling. So you've global average pool first and then produce the classes. And we can use this now in order to generate some labels. So the idea is that now we look at the penultimate layer and we produce class activation maps. So you see we have the fully connected layer that is producing the class predictions. We have essentially the input feature maps that we can then upscale to the original image size. And then we use the weights that are assigned to the outputs of the penultimate layer, scale them accordingly, and then produce a class activation map for every output neuron. And you can see that here in the bottom happening. And by the way, there's also a generalization of this that is then known as GradCam that you can look at in reference 12. So with this, we can produce class activation maps and use that as a label for localization. We can also go from bounding boxes to segmentation. And the idea here is that we want to replace an expensively annotated, fully supervised annotation with bounding boxes because they're less tedious and they can be annotated much quicker. And of course, this results in a reduced cost. Now, the question is, can we use those cheaply annotated labels and weekly supervision in order to produce good segmentations. And there is actually a paper out there that looked into this idea. You can see that in reference six. And the key idea is that you start with the input rectangles, then you do one round of training for a convolutional neural network. And you can see that the convolutional neural network is somewhat robust to label noise. And therefore, if you repeat the process and refine the labels over the iterations, you can see that we get better predictions with each round of training and refining the labels. So on the right hand side, do you see the ground truth and how we gradually approach this? Now, actually, there's a problem because the training very quickly degrades. The only way how you can make this actually work is that you use post-processing in the intermediate predictions. And the idea that they use is that they suppress, for example, wrong detections. Because you have the bounding boxes, you can be sure that within that bounding box, it's unlikely to have a very different class. 
then you can also essentially remove all the predictions that are outside the bounding box. They are probably not accurate. Then you can also check if it's less than a certain percentage of the box area. It's probably also not an accurate label. And furthermore, you can use the outside of a conditional random field boundary. So you essentially run a kind of traditional segmentation approach to refine the boundary using edge information. And you can use that as additional information to refine your labels. So an additional improvement can be done if you use smaller boxes. So on average, objects are kind of roundish. And therefore, the corners and edges contain, on average, the least true positives. So here are some examples of an image. And then you can define regions with unknown labels. Here are some results. And you can see that if we don't do any refinement of the labels and just train the network over and over again, then you end up in this red line, the naive approach. And over the number of training rounds, you actually are reducing the classification accuracy so the network degenerates and the labels degenerate. So that doesn't work. But if you use the tricks with the refinement of the labels with the boxes and excluding outliers, you can actually see that the two green curves over the rounds of iterations, you are actually improving. But to be honest, if you just use GrabCut Plus, then you can see that just a single round of iterations is already better than the multiple reruns of the application. And if you combine GrabCut Plus with the so-called MCG algorithm, this is the multi-scale combinatorial grouping. If you combine the two algorithms, you even end up with a better result in just one training round. So using a heuristical method can also help to improve the labels from bounding boxes to pixel-wise labels. But if you look at this, the fully supervised approach is still better. So it still makes sense to do the full annotation, but we can already get pretty close in terms of performance if we use one of these weekly supervised approaches. And it really depends on your target application. If you're already okay with, let's say, 65% of mean intersection over union, then you might be satisfied with the weekly supervised approach. And of course, this is much cheaper than generating the very expensive, dense ground tooth annotation. <laughs>